I'd like to welcome Dr. Haynes up to the stage to talk about some research projects. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rhys, and uh, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here to actually talk to you this afternoon and present a little bit of information on some of the, I think, really exciting research that Vance has been conducting in the area of immune function, and uh, we're all aware of how important that is. So what I'll do is briefly just cover a little bit of background, but then we've also heard a lot about peptides and proteins uh, this morning particularly, and I'd just like to actually cover exactly what these are because they feature a lot in my talk as well. After that, I'd like to discuss a, a project that we have already completed in this area of immune function and then lead on to um, our current project, which is underway right at this minute, and then just summarise at the end with some, uh, hopefully, some future prospects. So, really, bioactives have been of great interest to us ever since the start of the Velvet Research Programme um, down at Invermay in the, 80, in the 90s. And... Uh, we and other scientists around the world have managed to actually identify a great number of active components in the deer velvet, including things like growth factors, lipids, carbohydrates, and small organic molecules. However, really none of those have been convincingly linked as a direct cause of, uh, of some sort of activity that is of real consumer interest and would generate some consumer enthusiasm for deer velvet. And also, really very little has been known about the peptides in deer velvet. And largely, this was because of uh, deficiencies in the technology available to us. We just didn't have the, the technology to really get into peptides because of their complexity, as I'll um, lead on to in a, in a slide or two. However, as in all things, technology has moved forward hugely in the laboratory, and we now have available some really powerful mass spectrometers, such as this instrument here, which we have, this is one of our instruments from our laboratory at Lincoln. Mass spectrometers nowadays are able to identify components in complex mixtures thousands in, in a matter of hours. They're, they're really incredibly powerful things. But the other bit of technology that's been critically important is the development of very high-speed computing power. Um, these mass spectrometers generate ginormous amounts of information, and we have to have the means to actually deal with that with very powerful computers. And as everyone, I think, is aware, we now have basically more computing power sitting on our own desks at home uh, compared to what was in the back rooms of, of computer centres um, not, not so long ago, actually. It would take a whole room to give the same power as one of these things. So that's been a, a real advance. Now, I'll just give a little bit of background to proteins and peptides so we, we know exactly what we're dealing with. Proteins are really the, perhaps the most important component in, in your body in terms of uh, structural functions and also um, carrying out body processes. And they're produced uh, based on a blueprint of our, in our genes using the DNA to code for the structure of the protein. And most of the material in, in our tissues <coughs> excuse me, is, is protein. So even a, a bony tissue such as deer velvet has about 60% protein in it. But proteins and peptides are actually just quite simple polymers built up of building blocks called amino acids, of which there are about, excuse me, not sure how that's gone so far, of which there are 20 commonly found in nature. And when they're built up together into small chains, we get peptides. Um, where this is an example, we've got four amino acids joined together, valine, glycine, serine, and alanine in, in different colours here. So that's a, that's a peptide. Basically, a protein is just a, a big peptide. It's got hundreds or perhaps thousands of amino acids joined together end-to-end -end in a long chain. And it's important to recognise that we can actually produce peptides from proteins by chopping up that chain in specific places 
and enzymes are, are really good things for doing that. But as you can imagine, if you've got 20 possible amino acids at every one of these positions in a peptide or a protein, there's an absolutely ginormous number of possible structures that are basically quite similar but just varying in, the, in these chains. And that's quite difficult in terms of analyzing and identifying peptides and proteins in some proteins. So we need technology that will let us do that. What we do um, here, so if you imagine this is our, our dear velvet with thousands of peptides in the sample. Sorry, I have a problem with my thumb. Um, <laughs> What we have to do first is to simplify that huge mixture, and we use a, a technique called liquid chromatography, which really is just a, a column of a solid, special solid material, and we pass the mixture down this column, and as it comes through the column, the peptides separate out into groups. So we simplify the complexity of the mixture, and these groups of peptides will emerge off the end of the column, um, still as not pure substances, but as simplified mixtures. The next thing to do then is to, as they're coming off the, the column, is to feed them into our mass spectrometer, and that will just generate as many mass spectra, which is something that you see like this, for each, each one of those peptides, or as many of those peptides as possible, as they're separated off. And so there'll be thousands of these, of these mass spectra generated which we then feed into our computer and search against a, <coughs> a protein database to find patterns that match this fingerprint. And it's this fingerprint that really identifies what the structure of the, of the peptide is. So at the end of that process, in a single run, we'll typically identify hundreds of peptides out of our original mixture. My thumb is going in places it shouldn't go. So that's the technology that really lets us make advances here. So just come on to the, um, the project that we've already completed. And as I mentioned, this is in the area of immune function. And so really there's been a, a tremendous belief in Asian company, countries about the power of deer velvet to boost the immune system, similar to, to ginseng. And I mean, that's shown by the fact that many uh, people in, in Korea and in China will take velvet before winter just to build up the immune system and, and ward off any flus and infections. Now, over the years, Vance has conducted a number of studies right from the early days, but also as recently as uh, 2009 with a, a, an experiment in dogs. And we've shown that deer velvet definitely does boost activity. We've got good scientific evidence. But we haven't had any evidence as to what compounds in the deer velvet were actually causing that activity. Now, we have a good suspicion that it may well be due to peptides, because many peptides from other products are known to affect the immune function, boost immune function, and also the, um, the key molecules that actually regulate our body's immune function, um, things called cytokines, they themselves are actually peptides. So as I've just described, we actually have the technology now to, to get in and look at peptides in these very complex mixtures, and that was the basis of the project that we conducted with KGC. Now, KGC had prepared four different types of deer velvet extract, and they had shown in their um, in, bioassays that used mouse cells, that these extracts could enhance immune activity to varying degrees. The best of those extracts they had taken and done an animal study, uh, a, an infection challenge in mice, and again they showed that the, the velvet extract had very good activity in boosting the, the immune function of the, of the mice. Now, because of the really good relationship that uh, Rhys Griffiths particularly and the DIN's executive have built up with KGC um, and that trusting relationship between the two organisations, KGC provided us with 17 samples of their uh, various velvet extracts 
But most importantly, they also provided all of the, the bioassay information about how the extracts affected immune function. And our aim was then to take that information and try and go and, and look for the peptides that we thought uh, could be responsible for the activity. Now, this slide's a fairly complex slide, but it's an example of the sort of bioassay data that we received from KGC and their um, collaborators at Kyung Hee University. What we've got are the four types of extracts that were produced by KGC. The control extract is just a, a hot water extract of deer velvet. Then A, B, and C, uh, using that um, control, that water extract, and going through a fermentation process to produce three different types of fermented products. And each of these bars is a, a separate batch of one of those four types of extracts uh, as a colour coded. Now, the, the information on this slide is all to do with natural killer cell activation. Now, natural killer cells are a really important cell type that's involved in, the, in our immune response, and these cells are uh, responsible for protecting us against, uh, during the early stages of an infection, before we have any antibodies to, say, a, a bug. Um, these natural killer cells will get in there and try and protect us. So if we can activate those cells, we're having a, a positive effect on the immune system. And you can see that the control hot water extract and also extract B had a very low activity at uh, activating natural killer cells. C was sort of intermediate, but extract A had very good activity across all the batches that, uh, that they produced. So that was just one set of data. We were provided with a good number of um, different bioassay set uh, information. And what we had to do then was to, as a first step, was to categorise the activity of those four extracts in each of the bioassays. So this is a, just an example of the information where I've categorised that uh, natural killer cell activation information from the previous slide and also information from an assay that was looking at anti-inflammatory effects of the extracts and uh, again categorised those. And this column, which is the measure, is just the, the actual molecule that was measured by KGC's collaborators to as an indicator of the response of the mouse cells to the extract. Um, and these four here are actually, as I said, the cytokines, they're peptides. And you can see that uh, for these activities, extract A was consistently high in its activity. The control extract was mainly low, B was mainly low, and C was sort of in the middle. So for us to try and identify the peptides that were responsible for the high activity of, of extract A, the best way for us to do that was to compare its, all of its peptides with all of the peptides in the, the low activity samples. In other words, to compare A to the control sample and also to compare extract A to the um, extract B. So this is looking at comparison of all the peptides in both of those samples um, directly together. The results of that process was that we've identified 20 peptides that were more than twice as concentrated in the, the highly, extract, highly active extract A compared to the two low activity or lower activity extracts. And of those, one was a very simple peptide and it was over seven times more active in, uh, abundant, sorry, in extract A than in the control extract, and at the same time it was over three times more concentrated in extract A than in, in another of the low activity extracts. So that definitely correlated strongly with activity. Of the, of the, twen of the 20, eight were actually fragments of a single abundant deer protein, so it's where that protein had been chopped up into short, shorter pieces. That particular protein in other species is known to produce fragments that are bioactive. Um, for example, antimicrobial activity has been um, quite uh, strongly recognised. But in none of the information I've seen has 
a, an ability to boost immune function be mentioned for the peptides from the same protein from other species. Uh, very recently, though, a Chinese group did report that a longer fragment than we saw from this protein does have immune function. So it's from our results, I think there's a very good possibility that the eight fragments that we are seeing elevated in the, the, active, fra in the active extract, that they could also have immune boosting um, capability. Uh, and in themselves, these results were useful or could be used as uh, for markers for immune activity, but they're not necessarily the active ingredients. I'll emphasize that at this stage. But what they do is give us a, a tremendous springboard for further research to actually try and find those active or prove which ones are active, which is what the current project is all about. So in the current project, we have two objectives that uh, we're working on. The first is to investigate the activity of that very simple peptide that I mentioned. And it's so simple that we were able to have it synthesized as a pure um, synthetic peptide rather than try and isolate it. What we're doing is adding that peptide to two different types of human um, cells now. And both of these cell types are involved in when you ingest a product and it has an effect on your, your immune system, these two cell types are cells that will be involved in um, eliciting that response. In one of those cell types, we will measure the uptake of the, the simple peptide actually inside, into the cell, internalization of it, um, and that in itself is a, a strong indicator of um, immune boosting functionality. But with both of those cell types, we'll also measure the levels of immune function regulators or cytokines that are released by the cell types once we add the peptide to them. And again, the levels of those um, cytokines that are produced in response to our peptide will be very good indications of how active it is. So that's objective one. Objective two is really following up on the information about that protein where we saw fragments that were correlated with strong activity. What we want to try and do is confirm that the fragments we saw are active and see if there are any others. And we're going to do that by first purifying the deer protein and then use enzymes to chop it up. As I said, you can chop a protein up with enzymes into peptides. So we'll produce a, a mixture of peptides from our purified protein. We'll then use that liquid chromatography that I mentioned to separate our mixture of peptides into uh, close to purity or, or as pure as we can go initially. And then by adding them to our cells and from objective one, we can measure whether they're active as uh, immune for boosting immune function. And we can do a, a iterative process to come down to the individual peptides that have the activity and discard the others. The final step will be using our mass spectrometry technology to actually identify the sequence of our active peptides. Now, what does all this mean? Okay, so we've already identified peptides that are correlated with immune activity. And we know they're in deer velvet extract without fermentation, it's not um, limited to, to KTC's extracts. And we know that a, one, of, one of those, a, a very simple peptide and also fragments of a protein could be the active ingredients. If we can show that that actually is the case and identify those and perhaps other active peptides for boosting immune function, then that's going to be a real nuisance, a real help to um, support product development. Um, particularly, we, we are to develop QCSAs that would let us standardise a product for immune function, for example, or to guide the uh, development of a product. But most importantly, really, it, this is the sort of information, the, the identity of your active ingredients is required if you're wanting to register 
a product as a healthy functional food in either China or Korea. So if we are able to, to provide that information to the industry, then that, and they provide to their partners working in, in Korea and China, then that will then enable, hopefully, a registration of the Velvet product for, as a functional food, getting into the food marketing chain, and as I'm sure you're going to hear from Reese in, in detail now, how important that could be for the industry. Um, really, I think the sky could be the limit. So it just remains for me to thank the people both here in, in New Zealand and uh, recognise the contributions from our Korean colleagues um, in making all of this research possible. Um, Barnes for, for funding, also Ag Research for funding, and thank you for your attention. Thanks, thanks very much, Stephen. Have we got, uh, we've got one time for one quick question. Any itching, burning questions out there? Yeah, over the years we've spent uh, a huge amount of money on velvet research. When do we start seeing a dollar return to the farmer? <laughs> the, um, one of the things that has soaked up a lot of industry money and a lot of government money was the, uh, the Repairex wound healing project. Um, that is very close to going into clinical trial now. There have been uh, real difficulties in getting that operational, but that is close, so that's uh, one advance. This sort of research, which is, is new and really uh, brought about by the changes in technology, but we can use it for a lot of other applications looking at velvet um, research, it ena could enable some big changes in the way that mar the marketing of velvet uh, occurs in, in Korea and China, and then volumes and potentially prices, but particularly volumes, um, could be expected to increase. So, you know, that's a waffly answer, but I think the things are starting to move now um, when there was a little bit of a hiatus. It, it, it's a good question. I mean, another thing to add to it is, you know, we've got, we've got fantastic partners up in the market as well that are involved in the space. So it's not just a matter of Stephen working this in isolation. It's actually working with... Um, you know, with research teams that have got that expertise on the ground, got a desire and, and got a really good market there already. So that's, you know, we were seeing some really, um, we, we, what we're excited, I guess, about the um, you know, potential for research down the, down the track by partnering up with these magnificent companies. Stephen, I, um, I'm afraid it's not the uh, chairman, but I have a wee gift for you. Thank you very much for your Thank time. You. Thank you.